Hello and welcome to the Core Philosophy Podcast. This is episode 185, bringing the wisdom of Hebrew texts into the choral canon with Nicholas Weininger. Nicholas is a software engineer and composer who has a really interesting and unique story to tell about not only how he became a choral composer and musician and singer, but also joins me to discuss the power of the Hebrew language in choral settings, both in terms of its sonority and aspects of its diction that are inherent to the language, but also in the contributions that many ancient Hebrew texts can make to our philosophical discourses to this day. We discuss the difficulties of finding choral music with rich Hebrew text, and we also analyze a passage from Ecclesiastes that is the basis of a new cantata that Nicholas composed after the pandemic. The discussion then moves to the coincidence of this new cantata's birth into the world during a time of surging, and some would even say raging, anti-Semitism, and post-pandemic searches for accountability, for failed policies, and a reflection on that time. This was a very thought-provoking discussion, with lots involved, so I hope you will join us and stick around to the end. Thank you. I am really excited to announce, after many requests, there is now a Coralosophy merch store. All you need to do is go to the website, Coralosophy.com, look for the shop button in the top. You can find Literacy is Equity shirts and sweatshirts and signs for your room. You can find the Thank You for Your Mistake signs, which I love to put on the wall of a classroom, as well as a variety of other show designs. And you can sport your Coralosopher status by going to Coralosophy.com forward slash shop and checking out the store there. Be sure to listen, comment, and share your related experiences on this episode. When you see it posted on social media, you can go to the Coralosopher's Facebook page. And of course, on coralosophy.substack.com, you can also join in the conversations there. Stick around. One of the best ways that you can scratch your back and scratch mine at the same time is to enter Coralosophy at checkout. When you go to sightreadingfactory.com once or multiple times per year, however many it is that you do to renew your membership, your students' memberships. Also, when you get sheet music at graphitepublishing.com and endeavormusicpublishing.com, you can enter Coralosophy at checkout on those websites and save as well. And of course, getting the best choral folders on the market at mymusicfolders.com allows you to enter Coralosophy at checkout to save at all of those great vendors. Are you tired of managing multiple platforms to sell tickets, fundraise, and market your performances? Look no further than Ludus.com, an all-in-one solution that's easy to use and free to your organization. With Ludus, you'll have access to a suite of tools and resources specifically designed for the performing arts. From ticket sales to merchandise and fundraising, Ludus has got you covered. So why not give it a try? Save time, money, and resources. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. Patreon members really keep this show going financially every month, making sure all the costs are covered out of pocket. But they also get access to my Google folder of goodies, the private podcast feed. They find out who's coming on the show ahead of time and a variety of other fun little conversations that we're able to have over on the Patreon page. The producers and inner circle at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, Jonah Clicksbull, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, DF, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. All right, everybody, I'm here with Nick Weininger. Nick is a composer, and some would describe as an autodidact composer. And we're going to be talking about some ideas that he has about music, why he's passionate about it. I also find some, a lot of interesting things in Nick's story uh, related to his uh, use of a lot of Hebrew text in his choral music, which, of course, we, uh, we know is out there, but is not the most common thing. Some, I, I see posts looking for um, choral music with Hebrew content a lot because it's not as common. Right, and so I think we can talk about a lot of those issues uh, with Nick today. So, Nick, welcome. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. All right. So, who are you? Tell us a little bit about your origin story and why you're involved in choral music. Uh, kind of how you approach it. Where did it, that that desire, that passion, come from? Sure. Um, so, the summary is: I'm a, a lifelong choral singer, um, but I got into composing in adulthood first as a sort of avocation, uh, one might even call it a hobby, and now increasingly uh, as a, a second or parallel career. Um, and uh, so 
I've been singing in choirs since elementary school. Uh, I was very lucky to have excellent teachers all along the line. Um, I would say one of the main people I credit for my passion for choral music is my high school choir director uh, named Steve Kushner, um, who really had you know, very, very rigorous standards and challenged us uh, very greatly to, to give you an example of, of what that meant. If you know the Benjamin Britten cantata, Rejoice in the Lamb. Just um, did it. Yeah, we, I just did it. we sang Rejoice in the Lamb in high school from memory. Oh, wow. Like more than 30 years later, I can still sing the entire tenor part from <laughs> Rejoice in the Lamb from memory. And uh, like the emotional seriousness, the, the, the rhythmic complexity, right? Like Nimrod, the mighty hunter, da, 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 right? All these things like really blew my mind, right? When I was this you know, young teenager being introduced to the, uh, these aspects of what choral music could be. Um, and Steve has, has since become, uh, I'm so lucky to say, uh, a great friend. Uh, he's retired now, but he has this retirement project where every year a bunch of his alumni get together for an annual choral festival. Uh, and we oh, actually cool. prepare and sing a concert. And it's it's like, it's it's everything good about a high school reunion and nothing bad, right? We, we all are on the same page. We all know what we came here to do. We all studied with Steve and really like imprinted on his philosophy of, of, of singing and practicing. Uh, and, and so it's just such a, a wonderful experience of, of, of belonging and, and creating together. Yeah. Um, so the second great, I think, contributor to my, my adult passion uh, for choral music um, is the, the home choir that you know, I still regard uh, as my main choir that I sing in, um, which is the International Orange Chorale of San Francisco. Uh, and this is, this is named, by the way, for the paint color of the Golden Gate Bridge, right? The, the oh. paint is, you think of it as kind of reddish orange, it's actually called International Orange. Um, and so here's the story there. Um, my, my main academic field of study had always been math and computer science. That's uh, what I got my degrees in, um, and, and that's you know, what I've, I've worked in uh, in my remunerative life. Um, and in 2005, I moved out here to San Francisco, where I still live, uh, to take a job at Google. Uh, and that was terrific. I, I had you know, 15 very, very happy years at Google. Uh, and early in that time, there was another uh, choral nerd at Google who posted uh, a an, an notice uh, about this event called Chanticleer in Sonoma. Okay. And I don't know about this. I mean, I think probably your listeners all know Chanticleer. That group doesn't need an introduction. Yeah, uh, the group not, has been on the show. Oh, the whole, oh have they? The whole group. Terrific. Yeah. The fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. So... One less well-known thing is that every few years, they run this event where there's an auditioned group of volunteers who get to go sing with them in this workshop slash masterclass for four or five days up in the Northern California wine country, which is exactly as awesome as that description makes it sound. <laughs> it, cool. it, it's really like, yeah, you get to sing with Chanticleer, you get to party with Chanticleer, mm -hmm. and, and those are excellent things. Um and so at that time, you know, I was new to the area. Um, I was looking around for a chorus. Um, I knew, as I, I think um, a lot of people will resonate with, how hard it can be to find a really good volunteer chorus mm -hmm. uh, after you've graduated from college, let's say. Um, and so, you know, there were people there who really knew the Bay Area choral scene. I asked them for recommendations. Uh, and it led me to what was then quite a new ensemble, the International Orange Chorale, um, which had been founded as a, you know, let's do a volunteer chorus, but let's let's really step it up in terms of the, the level of musicianship, the level of polish, and the ambition of the kind of repertoire we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So they very quickly uh, got into doing a bunch of contemporary uh, choral music. And that helped introduce me to the, the contemporary com choral composing world. Uh, we ended up premiering pieces by you know, pretty well-known names. We premiered a piece by Caroline Shaw. We premiered one by Nico Muley. Um, 
and there were also some co composers in the choir. Uh, every couple of years, we would be one of the lab choirs for the San Francisco Conservatory um, when they would have a student competition for writing choral pieces. And so you would get these student pieces, which, as you might imagine, differ enormously, very enormously in quality and in difficulty. And so you'll have this you know, young, passionate, ambitious composer writing something really cool. And you look at it and you say, like, I have about one hour of rehearsal time total to sing this? Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> um, but it comes together, right? And it makes you a better singer um, and a better musician generally to, to do that. And so in this way, I really got socialized into this notion that, yeah, you know, choral composition is this exciting living thing. Yeah. Um, and, and I started to think, you know, I could do this. I would love to do this. This would be a lot of fun. Um, and so then there was the question of, okay, where do I start? I had never taken so much as a music theory course mm -hmm. uh, in all my schooling. Uh, all, all of my musical knowledge was gained basically through the practical knowledge that you have to have as a choral singer. Um, so I had that. I had friends who recommended to me uh, a couple of books um, that I would that I would recommend to anybody, actually. Um, uh, the Hindemith Concentrated Course in Traditional Harmony, for instance, was an excellent springboard. Um, but then once I started writing stuff, I had the incredible luck that because I had gotten embedded in this choral community, I had friends who I could invite over to read through my stuff. Yep. Right? And they good sight readers, right? You could get an octet together of people who actually thought it was fun to read new music. Mm -hmm. um, and this was gold because you can't, you can't learn what works and what doesn't work without actually having people sing the thing, right? Your computer will certainly not tell you. Right. Even <laughs> the score at the piano, right, will not really give you a good idea of you know, will it work? Is it idiomatic for the voice? Will it be easily heard and easily tuned, right, by, you know, reasonably good sight readers? Um, and so I was able to uh, get this, this very, very intense informal education this way. Um, and I wrote a few pieces for International Orange in 2011, um, which were my first premieres. And uh, one of those, a uh, setting of an E. Cummings poem called It May Not Always Be So, uh, is still among my favorite pieces, and you can find uh, a recording of it on YouTube. Um, so that was my autodidact beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, to be clear, I am not an autodidact now, and I'm glad I'm not, right? So that's another interesting story. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there. Um, so, because right, before you get to your your ne the next part of this, um, yeah. I want to actually go back because you, at the beginning you said that this is now a parallel, kind of becoming a parallel career. You mentioned that you worked at Google, but yeah. I, and so I'll, I will assume that your your day job, so to speak, is related to computers. But would you tell us a little bit more about that? So it's, uh, tell us a little bit more about what you yes. the other career is. Yes. Yes. So I I had. Uh, as I say, studied math and computer science in school, um, worked as a programmer for a couple of years afterward, then went to graduate school in pure math. Um, I have a PhD in pure math, and I thought for a while that I might want to be a mathematician. What makes um, math pure? So it's pure in the sense that you are trying to solve problems purely for the sake of advancing the knowledge of mathematical abstract truth, as opposed to applied math, where you're trying to solve some problem that is important for uh, some task in physics or in engineering uh, or in finance, right? There are lots of different applications. I see. Um, but pure math is sort of math for math's sake, as it were. Oh, okay. And, and so, yeah, no, I, I spent uh, a number of years in graduate school trying to prove new theorems. Um, and making a little bit of progress, uh, and also teaching math, um, which I actually loved. Um, but then a Google recruiter came to campus, and that was very exciting, right? I mean, 
in the early 2000s, Google was, you know, the, the, the cool new company uh, out there in the internet sector. Um, and I, I thought, gosh, you know, what, what an adventure it would be to actually get in on this. Um, so I started at Google um, as a software engineer in the, the search features division. Um, we would develop, you know, there's so many different kinds of things that, that you can see on the Google search results page, right? Not just the, the, the traditional 10 blue links, but all kinds of different presentations of information. And so I was part of the team that was developing those different presentations for different search purposes. Um, I, I worked there for a number of years. Um, I eventually shifted uh, toward internal infrastructure teams um, that, that made tools for other Google developers, right? Because by that time, Google had become a huge, huge company with tens of thousands of engineers. So that's a whole community of people who, who need specialized tools to make their own work better. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, again, that Google was a terrific place in so many ways, a, a amazing quality of people, very interesting and important problems to work on. Um, I ended up uh, getting into management there, becoming a, a, a software engineering manager and then a manager of managers. Um, and, you know, as that progressed, I got to a point where I said, okay, you know, I've been here for a long time. Is this really all I want to do with my career? Um, and, and I thought, no, right. I, I want to spend, I want to spend some time uh, pursuing my passions more independently. Um, and, you know, again, one of the very, very lucky things about having worked at Google for a long time is it gave me some cushion to do that, right? Gave me yeah. some, some financial security with which I could do that. Um, and so I, I left Google actually, uh, <laughs> this is a funny story. I left Google uh, at the very beginning of March, 2020, and I had initially planned that, oh, I'm going to spend 2020 traveling and singing choral music. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bad timing. <laughs> right. Terrible timing. Um, it, it, it was a, a blessing in a way that I left when I did um, because it, it gave me that time, you know, not, not only to, to really think uh, at home, but also to be at home for my family. Uh, my wife in that year had a, a very, very demanding job she was doing from home. My son was in distance learning. I was able to sort of keep the household together, be a, a, a teacher's aide, so to speak. You know, any parent who was there uh, during that time knows, you know, what that was like. Um, and it was incredibly fortunate for the family. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the couples I knew who had kids in school and two full-time jobs to do from home at the same time, um, they really had a, a hard time. Right. Yeah. So then, of course, you're uh, kind of jumping back into your compositional journey. Yes. Um, I, I would like to actually just, because uh, I know you were getting ready to tell us about your, you, you left the autodidact track. Well, and right. you started studying formally. Uh, would you just kind of briefly talk, tell us about that? And then I want to kind of move into some of the, uh, the textual choices that you make, I notice, in your, yeah. in your catalog. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so very briefly, um, I, I had taken my piece to one of my pieces to a workshop uh, about 10 years ago, uh, led by uh, a guy named David Conti, who's a, a professor at the San Francisco Conservatory. Yeah. He gave me some great great feedback. I said, look, I've been looking for somebody to study properly with. Uh, first, I asked him, can I study with you? He said, no, I'm not taking private students, but here's who you should study with. And that's how I got my first composing teacher. Okay. Uh, and then through that, I got a connection to another uh, choral workshop. This one focused around workshopping new compositions. Uh, and that was run the Choral Chameleon Institute uh, in New York, um, which I can still very highly recommend any emerging composers. It's a terrific, terrific time. Yeah, we've had um, Vince. We've had Vince on the show as well. We've had Vince. Okay, so I met Vince through the Coral Chameleon Institute. Yep, and I've studied with him uh, since then. So that's the last sort of five years. Um, and, and so, you know, the context uh, for for all is mere breath. Uh, this great 
you know, cantata that he uh, premiered with his other ensemble, the Empire City Men's Chorus, um, is that we had been working together for some time when the, the pandemic hit. And I started thinking, A, about writing a larger scale piece with my newfound free time, B, about writing a pandemic themed piece, trying to respond to the, the big emotions that I felt in 2020, as I think most of us felt some big emotions then. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Especially if um, the, the narrative was that, that it, was, it was our very breath that was the danger to yes. everyone around us. And, you're, and you're, you chose to title it All Is Mere Breath. Oh. Is there a connection? Coralosophy listeners will remember RyanMain.com, but he has recently created EndeavorMusicPublishing.com, which is something different, something bigger, and something better. Endeavor is not a marketplace. It's a traditional publisher with a 21st century business model, which means that they have editing. Each piece is chosen and selected with accessibility in mind. Endeavor supports composers with a majority of the sales going right to the composer. Plus, there are tons of voicings to fit the needs of your program, instant downloads, full recordings, practice materials, and more. So head over to Endeavor Music Publishing com now and check out the catalog. So yes, l- let me let me give you the the, the context on that choice. Um, so I have been for about twenty years now a big fan of a guy named Robert Alter, um, who is a, a professor uh, of of Hebrew and and of literature at Berkeley, I believe, um, and. And whose you know great life's work has been a new translation with extensive commentary of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, and one of the one of the moments that had really stuck with me from all of his commentary was him talking about uh, Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes or Kohelet in Hebrew, and. You know, if you're familiar with that from the more traditional Christian English translations, like the King James, let's say, you'll know the phrase vanity of vanities, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Hmm. And Alter says, this is a mistranslation. That's not what the Hebrew means, right? The the word hevel means breath. And, And so he chooses to make it concrete as he so often does, bringing the concrete metaphors of the Hebrew in, into his translation. He said he translates that repeated phrase as merest breath, all is mere breath and hurting the wind. And even before the pandemic, that had really struck me philosophically, even spiritually, um, as you know, something profound about the, the transience of life the ephemerality of the things of this world, the fact that nothing which we value and hold on to can really last in some sense. Mm -hmm. Um, In a way, it's it's something that I think people coming from a Buddhist spiritual tradition, right, that could also resonate a lot with them. But then, as you say, in 2020, suddenly there were all these other layers of meaning. A, like the sense of the transience and ephemerality and fragility of life was also something that was brought very much home to us. Mm-hmm. But then the metaphor of, you know, of breath functioning as this literal, like we are afraid of each other's breaths. We are afraid that our own breath is going to be messed up by this illness. Um, and, and so I said, okay, I, I have been meaning to do some significant setting of this text for quite a while. This is the time. And I want to put it in dialogue with other biblical verses that speak to the moment and speak to the emotions of the moment. Yeah. And so I was looking at the, you know, the second great aha moment for the piece was I was looking through Alter's great translation, looking through various portions of it and thinking, okay, what should I look at next? I should look at the book of Lamentations because, you know, man, there's a lot to lament this year. And the first verse of the book of Lamentations is how she sits alone, the city that was great with people. And I, I remember reading the thing, whoa, that is like almost too on the nose. <laughs> I, I have to start my piece with this because that is the most topical <laughs> verse imaginable. Um, and, and so that was actually the first part of it that I wrote was the, the, the mezzo-soprano saying uh, in this sort of keening lament in Hebrew, and the chorus responds, right, the city that was great with people. Um, And so it it kind of 
snowballed from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So um, I noticed uh, before you came on, I, I took a look a little bit at your website and your catalog and stuff. And I, not- I noticed there is quite a bit of Hebrew text. Can you talk yes. to us a little bit about um, that uh, and the about the connection you feel to uh, creating choral music with Hebrew text? Is it a um, is it a religious interest? Is it a um, a linguistic interest? Is it both? Is there a story there that you would be willing to share with why you feel the like that's that's kind of one of the ways that your musical voice is being expressed a lot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so first background context on myself. Um, I would identify as culturally Jewish. Okay. Uh, I am by ancestry half Jewish. My father's side of the family is Jewish. Uh, I am not religiously observant. Um, I have not been re- religiously observant, but over the past, again, I would say 10 to 20 years, I've gotten more and more deeply interested in the Jewish philosophical tradition, the Jewish scholarly tradition, the Jewish spiritual tradition um, as something that's really worth studying and reflecting on and learning from. And uh, again, Robert Alter, um, you know, the, 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 the compelling nature of his translations and his commentaries really played a key role in bringing me to that. And one of the things that he does is really try to bring a sense of the poetic rhythm of biblical Hebrew and the poetic structure of biblical Hebrew as much as possible as in, into the English translation. Okay. Right. So he will try to reproduce the rhythms uh, and, and the alliterations and the kinds of vowel sounds and the compactness, right? Hebrew is a very compact language in the sense that it can express a lot in relatively few syllables. Um, and, and so he tries to give as, as much of a sense of that, how it sounds, as he can in English. And then in his commentary, he often says, and the Hebrew verse I am translating is this. Um, and so, you know, you see how hard that is to, to like bring across this sentiment in English. Um, and so that got me, uh, really looking at, okay, what are these, what are these initial Hebrew verses? Uh, what do they sound like? Um, and to me, they sound very musical. Uh, yeah. They sound very lyrical. Um, they have a they have a sonority that that I think is very powerful. Um, sometimes a bluntness, a roughness, right? The frequency of the the ha, the back guttural, right, adds to that. Um, but also, again, just the compactness and alliteration. Um, of of the language, um, really, I think is an underappreciated musical property of it. Yeah. Um, did, now, did and, you did you do synagogue as a kid? Were you in, in in that at all? No, no, no. I I was raised in a secular household. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, so the reason I ask is because I so I also would say describe myself as somebody that was. Um, kind of culturally raised in a religious tradition that I don't really practice anymore in explicitly, but yet that the culture that goes with that religious tradition is still very important to me. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Is that kind of how you would describe it? I think that is part of how I would describe it. Yes. Except, you know, as I say, I I was raised secular. I was not raised, uh, uh, you know, going to any regular worship service. I think I went to a few high holy day services, you know, we would often have, you know, Passover seders uh, and and light the candles for Hanukkah. Um, But that was about it. That was, you know, the the extent of my Jewish life, so to speak, as a kid. Um, But but again, right, the, the intellectual tradition, the philosophical tradition, the scholarly tradition, the spiritual tradition are all bound up in Jewish history and life and learning. Uh, and and that whole complex of things, I think, is culturally tremendously rich and powerful and valuable. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, I I, th- I think about um, I did a I, I direct a um, professional local ensemble here in Kansas City. It's a very part time kind of a thing. And many years ago, uh, we did a an all Hebrew text concert. And oh, so I, I have. Um, 
kind of firsthand experience with the idea that it's actually kind of hard to find a lot of choral music of kind of very awesome. rich quality with that uh, th those Hebrew texts. And of course, my understanding of why that is is just that the Hebrew that uh, the Hebrew religion or the Jewish religion is is not a choral tradition in the same way that the Christian tradition is a choral tradition, right? If you go back to like within the worship service, you go going back a thousand years or 1500 years or whatever, um, you're not going to see the same um, ubiquitousness of choirs as, so yes. is my under, do you, would you agree with my understanding? As far as I know, and, and again, you know, do not paint me as an expert on Jewish religious practice. No, I no, I won't. <laughs> but, uh, the, as far as I know, that's true, right? There is certainly a, a tradition of singing, the cantorial tradition. Yes. It's very, cantor is an, an important uh, worship leader, um, but choral polyphony in particular um, has not been part uh, of the historic Jewish worship tradition in the way it has um, of, of Christian traditions. That's, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so do, do you think, do you think that your contribution, uh, or do you think about that at all when you're creating this choral music it, with Hebrew texts that's intended to be sung, you know, by high level musicians and, uh, trying to create those rich textures that you're trying to create? Uh, do you consider yourself as, as kind of adding to that body that where there is a gap, where there is a need, or is it just because you enjoy the language? So in, increasingly, it is thinking about that liturgical need, if you will. Um, I think when I started, uh, it was not that. It was about trying to just use this beautiful text for, for an artistic and emotional and philosophical purpose. Uh, I wrote uh, my very first Hebrew piece uh, as a setting of, if you know the verses from the Song of Solomon, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, mm -hmm. that there's such beautiful, sensual imagery in that. Um, but I wasn't finding settings of the original Hebrew text, which I think is also beautiful. And so I said, I'm going to write this. Yeah. Um, and then I, I did a set of pieces for the Choral Chameleon Institute uh, called Songs in Time of Peril, um, which, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the verses are still quite topical. Um, and those verses I set not for any liturgical use at all, not with any thought of how someone might sing this in a synagogue, but simply as this is a very powerful emotional text that speaks to some universally important and also timely human sentiments. Um, and, and this is a really beautiful lyrical way to bring across that text through the original words of the, the scriptures that were put down in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that was also largely the case for all is mere breath, except that I end that cantata with something that really is part of the liturgy, uh, a prayer called the Ose Shalom, um, which uh, among other things um, is the concluding section of the mourner's Kaddish, um, right, the prayer that is said for the dead. And, and so I thought, you know, it was important to memorialize the dead from COVID, um, but also it's, it, it's a prayer for peace. Um, in, and I thought that also resonated in what has increasingly become not such a peaceful time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've gotten you know, from that, the idea that, okay, you know, maybe the, the, the liturgical staples of the Jewish tradition are also things that can be enriched through modern choral settings. Um, I, I wrote for International Orange uh, just this, this past fall, we had our, our holiday program. We don't usually do a holiday program, but we did a program of holiday music. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, any good holiday program should have a Hanukkah piece on it. <laughs> and, and so I wrote uh, for that a setting uh, of the Hebrew blessings that you say while lighting the candles. And um, then, you know, my very late breaking news um, is that uh, my, my newest premiere on the, the, the calendar is going to be in April of this year in Cincinnati uh, because a, a group called the Cincinnati Camerata 
had a composition competition for music appropriate for a Jewish temple. Okay. Uh, and I had been reading a bunch of Jewish devotional poetry, looking for texts. And I found this very, very beautiful poem called Lecha Dodi, um, which uh, is a, a Sabbath themed poem, right? You're greeting the Sabbath metaphorically like a beautiful bride. And there's a lot of allusions to the Song of Solomon in it. Uh, you know, again, a, a great love of mine. Um, and so I set this Lecha Dodi uh, in a way that I thought was exciting and, and up-tempo and joyful. Uh, and it won this competition. So the Cincinnati Camerata uh, are going to premiere this piece in April. And, and so now I actually have several pieces that have this, uh, this use. And um, in terms of you know, plugging my stuff, if any of your listeners uh, work for or know somebody who works for uh, Transcontinental Music Publishing, which I found out is the, the main uh, choral publishing arm of the one of the major reform uh, Jewish organizations in the U.S. Um, I'd love to be in touch because <laughs> I think I have a portfolio of music that yeah. could be for their catalog. Um, and and I'm, I'm interested in getting into this more, both because, as you say, it is an underserved niche. Um, and because it's it's something where again the the lyricism of the language, the the philosophical stance of the texts, and my compositional sensibility seem to fit well together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so with um, you've referenced the "All Is Mere Breath" the cantata that we're that you were talking about a second ago, and am I correct in understanding that that project? Well, actually, I I just would rather you you tell me um, yeah. when you when did you start writing that? Actually, putting pen to paper. Yeah, so uh, I wrote the first little bits of that in June or July of 2020. Okay, so right in the midst of everything. Yep. Right, and then and then um, you're they're working on we've got this project right now of a recording of it um, that is going to come out soon. Is that correct? Has, has come out. Has so, come out. So let me let me tell you about the arc of this piece. Yes. Um, I, I wrote the piece starting in 2020. Uh, had a complete draft for the first time in, let's say, early 2022. Uh, Vince had at that point already thought that he wanted to put it on uh, the Empire City Men's Chorus program for March of 2023. Um, so we worked on like getting the whole thing finished over uh, you know the summer of 22, getting it engraved properly. Uh, they rehearsed. Uh, and uh, then they, they gave the premiere performance live in New York um, this past March of 2023, uh, funny story. Um, I came out there, uh, you know, expecting to, to hear this premiere in, in triumph. Um, and I didn't get to, because I got COVID the day of the first performance. <laughs> so my, my COVID memorial cantata, I still have not heard full, fully performed live because, because of COVID. Of COVID. Wow. Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so, the universe has a, 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 a wry sense of humor. Let's let's put it that way. Um, but uh, then Vince also did this recording session um, with the whole uh, ensemble, and uh, we were able to uh, contract with Navona Records uh, to produce and release this album, um, which just came out on this past December eighth, I believe, and is available on all the major streaming services. Mm -hmm. okay. And then, uh, sorry if you if you said it and I missed it, but then the, when did the actual when did the album drop? When did it become available? Sure, December eighth. Okay, of, of twenty twenty three. Of twenty twenty three was the Got album it. release. Correct. Yeah. So it, it's interesting because you talk about this this timeline of um, you know uh, responding to COVID with this music, uh, having Vince's group. Uh, create this this uh, this recording um, kind of as a, a monument and there's there's even uh, all of these kind of uh, I guess you could say immortal immortalizing the dead as we talked about earlier and you've got this whole this whole narrative arc which is I think is a beautiful thing and then um, and then October 2023 happens with the attack yeah. in uh, the the Hamas attack on Israel and then the subsequent war that's now been going ever since then. There, uh, and the reason I was asking about that timeline is because, of course, you couldn't have known back in 
um, you know, of 2020 when you started writing this, that it might drop into the world in a, yet another cultural context that is, whether you intended it or not, is going to have an impact in this world now where we're seeing anti-Semitism on the news on a, um, in a much higher degree. It's, of course, it's always been there. I'm not saying it's new. But that, that there's this um, completely new context now for how a cantata with Hebrew text uh, exploring Jewish thought and exploring uh, philosophies of uh, of kind of this rich history might land in a different cultural context. Um, you know, so th- are, do you have thoughts about that? Is, it, is that something that you um, that you've reflected on at all? I yes, I've definitely reflected on it. Um, I think you know again the the Ose Shalom text, um, which is both a part of mourning the dead, uh, and also is in its in its literal meaning a prayer for peace. Um, that only becomes more meaningful now, uh, and in a way that, as you say, I could not have anticipated. Um, I think it can be a sign that you've chosen as a composer the right sort of text to set when it continues, you know, despite having been written in one time for one purpose, it continues to uh, accrue new relevance, mm-hmm. right? History goes on. Um, there's, there's another piece of the cantata that I think also has unexpected relevance. There is, there's a rather angry uh, movement where there's a, a mezzo-soprano aria uh, about false prophets. Um, and you know, talking, talking about how people who should have known better screwed up and, and, and damaged the lives of others by screwing up. Um, and I think that's something that, again, people feel even more uh, these past few months, even though I originally wrote it about like the, the total shambles that was the institutional response to COVID in 2020. Mm. It's acquired this other layer of meaning. Um, there's, a, again, another lament uh, repeated, le mort shalom shalom ve ain shalom, uh, which Alter translates as, and they said, all is well, all is well, and all was not well. Mm. Mm-hmm. Also translated, and they said, peace, peace, and there was no peace. Um, yeah. So that's a way in which um, I hope it can continue to speak. I hope all is mere breath. Uh, the peace can continue to speak to audiences and can, can continue to provide a sense of belonging and consolation in what is a very difficult time that we are living through. Right. You know, that's interesting because I, um, now, now we get into like kind of the good part, at least the way I think about um, these conversations, because you, the, what you just said, the peace, peace, but there's no peace. To me, I, that's a microcosm right there of the power of choral music as, an, as a medium in that um, we can say peace, we could sing a song, we could sing peace, peace, and it doesn't mean there's peace in the world. And there would be one way to look at that and say, well, then what you just did was meaningless because it didn't create any actual peace materially in the world. And then I would respond, you're right, it didn't create peace, but it doesn't invalidate the need to sing for it. Um, because there, it's, all, it's almost as if um, we then give words this magic power or this expectation that they are going to have a magic power. And if the if I say peace and it doesn't result in some magic spell that causes the whole you know utopia on earth, then I just wasted my time. And I would say, well, no, that's just not how the world works. And so, uh, so I want to just uh, kind of lay out a framework here for for this. And I just and feel free to respond on this show. Um, guests are fully allowed to disagree with me. So, um, and so here's how I see this. So with the anti-Semitism context now that has been that your your piece, whether you, like we said before, whether you intended it that way or not, it's kind of landing in the world in this time, right? Yeah. Um, I I've always thought of uh, anti-Semitism as kind of there there are two kinds of it, and uh, there's the what you could say like the 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 
the right, we'll, I'll just call it the right wing version, which tends to be very like blood and soil, um, ethnically driven, you're not like me, um, and, and therefore you're not in the country club or, you know, whatever. There's that kind. And then there's the other kind, which I will call the left wing version of it, which is um, Israelis and uh, the Jews of the 21st century are um, are the are are also colonizers. They are the the wealthy elite that um, that are bad based on the fact that they are creating an impressive regime there in Israel. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because a a, a piece like yours stands then as that 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 call for peace peace in in a world where that dichotomy still exists. Thoughts yes. about that? Am I and am I just like? too philosophical. Well, I probably am. That's why this show exists, but go ahead. This is an important thing uh, to try to respond to. Um, and, and I would say that there is, there is so much that, that in both of the, the kinds of hatred you're describing that seeks to cast Jews as the other. Right, that that seeks to say, oh, you're you're not like, you know, the good people, you know, the civilized people, you know, the freedom fighters, the you know, the oppressed, the, whoever it is you valorize, right? The anti Semites will say, well, Jews aren't that, right? And yep. the more that you can show through whatever kind of artistic medium, but particularly through music. That is just obviously untrue, right? Yeah. That 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 the the Jewish tradition is a crucial part of the human experience and the humanistic tradition, and and that you know as complicated and flawed and fraught with mistakes and crimes as our history is, as the history of every human people is, right? we are still grappling with these universal things and, and trying to do you know, the fundamental human things, memorializing the dead, protecting uh, the innocent, um, grappling with the, the, the fragility of the world. Um, the, the more you can show that, the more I, I think it, it can serve as a, an assertion um, of, of, of Jewish joy, if you will, of, of, of Jewish cultural strength, which is quite different from any institutional uh, or political strength. Um, it, 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 can, it can demonstrate um, a, a universalism and, 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 and essentialness of this strand of the human story. Mm -hmm. that to, to the extent that music can fight prejudice, can fight hatred, um, I hope it can contribute a little bit to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, um, it, can, it can work to reduce prejudice, especially when we are talking about, it's why I say the power of choral music and not just music. Uh, but I would put into this category other types of ensemble music making. And it's because it's partly the music itself and the text and what we're expressing, but it's also partly the act of making the music together in the first place works to reduce that prejudice. Because we, we, we know, and, and psychologists have studied for a long time, uh, the effect of simple proximity and working together and finding a common goal that can reduce prejudice over time by exposing ourselves to each other. And so unless you're going to create a, an ensemble of 100% practicing Jews to perform this piece, then what you're going to be doing is exposing people to each other. And by doing that, we create this little bit of, a little bit more peace. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the most powerful ways to do that is that when you do have people from different backgrounds encountering a new piece of music, the, the different meanings it has for them uh, and the different ways that they can talk to each other about the meanings that it has for them can help build that common ground. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that Vince in the Empire City Men's Chorus actually did this beautifully with All Is In Your Breath. Um, they 
posted on Instagram a series of short videos from choristers, each talking about a different aspect of what the music meant to them. And for some of them, it was a religiously tinged meaning. For some of them, you know, they did have an observant Jewish background and they talked about here is how, you know, the feelings that I have in this kind of synagogue service, you know, uh, are reflected in this piece. Mm -hmm. For other people, it was just their personal experience of having lost a loved one to COVID um, and how the, the desire to, to memorialize and honor them through singing this affected them. Um, and, you know, for others, it was like, here's, here is how the, this piece made me feel less alone in the experience of being alone in 2020. Mm -hmm. And all of those are valid ways of interacting with a piece like this and deriving meaning from it. And if you can, you know, come to an understanding um, of, of that diversity of thought and feeling through this common experience, then maybe you can come to a better understanding of our common humanity. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderfully, wonderfully said. I do have one more kind of uh, point of curiosity about this piece. If you'll humor me um, Please. Er earlier, you said that this partly why you wrote this piece was a response to the institutional shambles that was COVID or the, uh, can you say more about what you meant by that? Yeah. Um, th th there was just, there were so many people who said very confidently things that turned out not to be true. Um, <laughs> yep. There were so many people who pushed policies that were trying to free people and ended up killing people or policies that were trying to save people and ended up uh, not saving people, but just making their lives worse. Uh, people were not thinking clearly about what evidence demanded. People were not thinking clearly about how to balance different, uh, uh, very tough trade-offs and um, the quality. I mean, the, the quality of our, our national debates and discussions has left a lot to be desired this past decade in general, I would say, but, but this was really particularly a low moment. Um, and, and so, again, reading through various verses, um, talking about like finding the verses excoriating false prophets saying, you know, they saw empty visions and false divinations. Um, they, they sought to mislead the people and say all was well when all was not well. Uh, and there, there, was one, uh, there was one particular verse uh, which was they were not even ashamed. They did not even know how to be disgraced. Mm -hmm. And and again, I think not just my anger, but I think a lot of people's anger uh, around the way things went uh, that year could be captured in that. And, and so I, uh, you know, I, I, I said all of this for you know, mezzo soprano uh, soloist, but also you know for very solemn choral responses to it. Um, and it was one of the most cathartic parts of writing the piece was being able to channel like all of my like most frustrating um, and sometimes frightening anger uh, into music. Right. Um, it was being able to, to write from that place uh, and kind of get that out. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, that's that's really well well summarized because I I would say I I largely agree. In fact, this this show became the platform that it is today because of my co my COVID coverage in 2020. I I was fortunate enough to have um, some pretty top level experts who were willing to come on the show. In fact, the very first time was in March of May, sorry, May of 2020. Um, uh, Amish Adalja from Johns Hopkins Pandemic Center. Um, gave us 30 minutes to talk to choir directors about this idea that nobody's going to be able to sing again for the next two years, which was, of course, confidently stated um, by our national organizations and then pressed out there and sent to the newspapers and all of these things. And I had one of the top experts in the world come on this show and talk, talk some sense into people, which essentially was what, what happened. And one of the things that I noticed um, and then you talked about the catharsis of that frustration is then just last year, last summer, um, I sat about six feet away from Francis Collins, the head of the NIH during 
pandemic, during the pandemic, while he sat there and told an audience right in front of my face, not filtered through narratives on social media, but just right there in person, I got to hear him say that our big mistake, when he says our, he means the government kind of official response to this, is that we uh, didn't do a good enough job uh, portraying our lack of certainty related, related to certain policies. Um, he said, looking back, I wish that we had done a better job of saying, there's a lot that is changing all the time in terms of what we know. Here's what we think right now is the best idea to do, but we are not sure. Yes. And he, and he instead, they portrayed, the, the government sources tended to portray a, like, this is what is true. And if you don't agree with us, you are, <laughs> you are a misinformer, right? And he looks back on that and regrets that. And he also looks back on that and regrets... Uh, that they didn't consider very well enough how a policy created for New York City, for example, during the worst part of the pandemic might affect people in other parts of the country uh, that might, like you said, uh, the policy itself can act, act that's intended to save people's lives could actually cause other harms that we didn't consider. Um, and so it's a, that's an interesting thing to hear you say uh, that you were uh, kind of maybe frustrated by some of those those same things uh, the 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 lack of consideration lack of humility on the part of our leaders during that time could be could very well be expressed through frustrating music is that am I on to something here absolutely that that's you're absolutely spot on yeah the, the lack of humility um my my personal stake in this was that you know my son's school was closed for the entire 2020-21 school year basically well yeah because you're in the bay area that was like yes that ground zero over, of over the objections of people who had public health expertise who were increasingly saying no now we know that the right trade off is actually to reopen the schools uh and and they were not reopened but the Yes, but the overall lack of humility, as you say, uh, was definitely one of the big frustrations. Um, and, and I think I know the Francis Collins talk you're referring to. This was at the Braver Angels convention. It was. I was there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm a Braver Angels member myself. Haven't been to any of the conventions. No way. The <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And uh, um, I, I, I really have uh, the greatest admiration for what they're doing, and, and I thought. Yes, having having Collins um, talk frankly about those mistakes is something that we so so rarely see in mm -hmm. uh, present institutional life. Yep, yeah, and of course, in the choral, uh, like I said, with the choral uh, organizations, uh, very much from the top down, fell lock into lockstep with that lack lack of humility. And, yes, and this uh, this show uh, we kind of were, were, we made a name for ourselves here by being the willing to push back against that um, huh. and, and make, make some arguments, present some, um, some, some expert opinion, but one that didn't kind of line up with that. And, and the, it was a fallacy the whole time to, to present this idea that there is that, that there is a, a correct answer in this brand new landscape where nobody has had a chance to do <laughs> You know, anything, I don't know if you're familiar with the, I'm sure you are, the evidence triangle, the concept that there's this, like, uh, evidence at the bottom of the triangle is not very good quality, but as you go up towards, you know, certain types of studies and uh, meta-analyses and all that kind of stuff, and here we are at the, bre the very beginning of a new thing that nobody has ever studied before, and yet we're already talking as if we're at that top of the triangle. Um, and it was, uh, you don't have to be a scientist to call bullshit on that. Yep, agreed. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's really awesome. And, and it's cool to hear that you're a fellow braver angel. Um, I'll have to, um, to, to be in touch about, uh, and I highly recommend their, uh, their conferences. They're very, very cool. In fact, life, life changing. I did yeah. an episode, uh, did an ep episode uh, on this show kind of recapping the conference. I'd encourage you to go, uh, go check that out, but, uh, but oh. very cool. Well, Nick, on the way out, I want you to make sure, and we'll kind of wrap this up cause I've had you for an hour or so. Um, I want you to tell us just kind of line out for people. How can they find music by you? Uh, yeah. beyond just all is mere breath. Um, how can they find the recording that we're talking about and, uh, any, in a, like maybe exciting plans for the future for you related to choral music? 
Absolutely. So very quickly, uh, nicholasweininger.com is my website where you can find scores uh, and recording links and news. Um, a, and I try and keep it updated as best I can. I, I'm, <laughs> uh, not always, but uh, it, it usually has pretty good new stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, album, um, as I said, is available from Navona Records, N-A-V-O-N-A. -A, uh, and you can also uh, find it by searching for my name on Spotify uh, or Apple Music um, or YouTube, I think now, um, or any of the other major streaming services. Um, that same search will also point you to a couple of albums that the International Orange Chorale has made that include a couple of my shorter pieces. Um, and in terms of where I am now, what I'm, what I'm doing, um, I just finished a shorter cantata uh, for mixed chorus and a few instruments that I've, I've sent it to a, a competition. So I want to you know, give them sort of first right of response, but uh, Competition odds being what they are, I expect I'll be uh, getting to uh, do uh, some more promotion of this piece myself. Um, so if you're interested uh, in premiering a cantata like that, or if you're interested in premiering uh, more uh, short form a cappella, uh, Jewish themed or Hebrew choral music, um, or just contemporary choral music in general, uh, please get in touch. Awesome. That's very great. And I'll put uh, links to anything you want me to link in the show notes of this episode. And the, our audience is kind of accustomed to being able to find that uh, for easy clicking. So Nick, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you as always for listening. On the way out, let's review the ways you can help this show survive for another five years. We're coming up on the five-year anniversary in February of this show. Are we going to make it five more? Well, that depends on you in the audience. The things that I need you to do to help me survive. Go to Patreon and sign up for $3 a month. If the entire audience did that, I could probably do this job full time. That's one way you can help. $3 a month. It's a coffee. So chip in there. And of course, enter the Coralosophy checkout code at sightreadingfactory.com whenever you have the chance to do it. Mymusicfolders.com graphitepublishing.com, endeavormusicpublishing.com, all take the Coralosophy discount code, which helps you, and it also helps me. And of course, the other big things you can do are to help people see the show, like participate in social media conversation threads, share the episodes. All of these things are huge and help people find the show. When more people find the show, I'm able to do it easier and cover my expenses. So thank you all for listening, and I hope you will tune in next time as we keep the conversation going.